Good evening. I, I think that um, by the end of this couple of hours, you're really going to know who you can give Zoster vaccine to, because we're going to now base some of our clinical decision making on an actual case that I'm going to present, and then we're going to utilize the data that we heard from Gil and Gary, who very nicely summarized all of that, just to emphasize, again, some really important take-home points that we can do in the clinic. And as the chair of quality for the Division of Gastroenterology and Hepatology at Mayo Clinic, I can tell you, I can air our dirty laundry at how poor and low our rates as an IBD group are about vaccinating our own patients. So we have a long way to go even at Mayo. All right, so we have a 60-year-old gentleman with long-standing ileoclonic Crohn's disease. He's doing well on azathioprine, two and a half milligrams per kilogram. And he has had prior corticosteroid courses to induce remission. Not right now, though, but he has had steroids in the past. He has mild hypertension and a low testosterone. And at the time that you see him, he's had labs and his hemoglobin's fine. His CRP is less than three. His sed rate is zero. His albumin is normal. He has a CT enterography and he has stable thickening of 20 centimeters of terminal ileum and there is no active disease present. So what else? So you've gone over all, you've checked all the boxes and you've made sure he doesn't have active disease. So what else in that 15 minutes are you going to talk to him about and that you want to know? What does he do for a living? his family and social history, his vaccination history, and personal preferences about medications, the modality of it, the safety, and the efficacy. So he's 60 years old. What else do you want to know? Well, it turns out, okay, so he's a mechanical engineer, so he's very sedentary. He's an avid golfer. Okay, great, but he uses a cart. So again, he's still physically inactive, and he probably is not wearing enough sunscreen when he's out golfing. And also, oh yeah, by the way, Dr. Kane, I'm considering joining my church group for a humanitarian mission to West Africa in the upcoming months. So you really do want to know what's happening in the lives of your patient, especially if they're well and they're considering this kind of travel and you go, okay, because you do not want to get the call the day before they're supposed to leave saying, oh, you have to write me a letter about my yellow, <laughs> yellow fever vaccination. So he's going to West Africa. We've heard that it's sub-Saharan Africa that it is endemic for yellow fever. So is he safe to go without a yellow virus vaccine? Okay, so what are you going to recommend for the 60-year-old who was on 2.5 milligrams per kilogram of azathioprine? Tetanus every 10 years. So he's a mechanical engineer, not a, 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 in construction, but certainly tetanus every 10 years. Zoster, which one are you going to give him now? Which was it he safe for? Certainly we can talk about um, Shinrix. Influenza, we've heard that timing, you can give it essentially anytime you remember to do it and if it's available. Um, the pneumococcal pneumonia, I'll just show you again just in a cartoon um, summary, what Gil has already told us about what to do with pneumococcal. The yellow fever, it is live, it is contraindicated in any dose of azathioprine that you're giving, but it's for sub-Saharan Africa, not necessarily West Africa. And then typhoid and polio, so Tdap vaccinations. All right, so herpes we've heard about, and what do I want to just emphasize again that you've already heard is that it's one in three in the U.S., and don't forget that Anywhere between 10 and 18% of patients are actually going to get post-herpetic neuralgia as well. So um, for anybody who's had um, shingles already in their lifetime, a lot of us are on gabapentin. So that, again, yes, we know that the incidence of zoster is higher in IBD, and that increases with steroids for sure, azathioprine and 6-MP, and that um, this older data came before we even knew what, what was going on with anti-TNFs. I think I'm in the interest of time, I'm going to skip this. But again, again, this is Millie's work that we can go back to. And if you just look across that table, you can see that if you have IBD, that your um, incidence per 100,000 is vastly higher um, for whichever disease you're talking about. We've already talked about the steroid use. And so let's just, again, remind ourselves about pneumonia, that it is um, the most common infectious cause of death in the U.S. So if you have IBD, you are not immune from just the baseline risk of living in the U.S. So you have to add 
that risk of the IBD and any medications they're taking. The mortality of those hospitalized for pneumonia in 2005, so that was 10 years ago, over 10 years ago, was close to 5%. So um, again, in looking at some of Millie's data, data from a retrospective cohort that, um, and nested case control work um, in this large health administrative database that pneumonia as defined by bacterial pneumonia treated with a systemic antibiotic matched, again, you can see that either diagnosis of IBD compared to the non-IBD population is significantly greater. So pneumonia is a big deal. We already heard about steroids, and I will just remind you about the, the interest of PPI therapy in this, because we're all just gastroenterologists in the room, not just IBDers. And again, it's the steroids that are driving this. And remind, I'll remind you that our 60-year-old patient who is well has been on steroids in the past, not now. So perhaps we don't have to worry so much about the steroids story for him at this point. So here's a nice, I'm, I'm very much into cartoons and pictures, and so this is how I sort of in my mind keep this slide in my head, that if they are over 19 years of age and they have not been vaccinated, they start with the 13, because that's the smaller number, and then anywhere between eight weeks and one year later, they get the 23, and then five years later is when they get that booster. If for whatever reason they've already had the, the, the 23 valent, that the time that you find out that they've had the 23, any time after that, you can give them the 13, and then five years later, you give them a booster. So if they're naive, then they get the 13 first, and then the 23. So what other conditions should he be screened for? So we've already, Gary set me up nicely for a lot of these things. So osteoporosis, he's a, a somewhat a sedentary gentleman, but he has IBD, he's been on steroids before, Fracture risk, uh, looking at uh, the, the data for out of Manitoba, Canada, that you can see that if patients are over 60, that's where the highest risk is at twofold for actual hip fracture. So in our guideline, we talk about the management of osteoporosis, which starts with lifestyle changes. So, hey, get out of your cart and walk that golf, car, uh, that golf club um, around, drag it, and do the golf course walking um, rather than riding around in a cart, and that he is 60, we should make sure that we've checked his vitamin D levels and we've done a DEXA scan on him. Because he also has a history of low testosterone, so he does have a, an endocrine reason why he might actually have lower bone density than we thought. So again, vitamin D and IBD, there's a very interesting uh, um, clinical correlation there between deficiency and IBD, which is chicken and egg, we're not sure. But we have to know the risk factors. He's not on steroids right now, but he was. It's weight-bearing exercise and making sure he's supplemented, and then screening DEXA if he's of the right risk factor profile, which he is, he's 60, and he has a low testosterone. We have not talked about cancer, obviously, as gastroenterologists, we are interested in prevention of colorectal cancer in all of our patients, not just IBD. This is obviously a whole symposium lecture in and of itself. We are all very aware of the increased um, incidence of colorectal cancer in our IBD patients, that it goes up with the duration and extent of disease, particularly in ulcerative colitis. These are data that are now uh, over a decade old, that the relative risk in Crohn's disease um, for any cancer is somewhat stable. Hematologic, also stable. Interestingly, intestinal has actually gone down. And the same for relative risk for cancers in ulcerative colitis. So is it inflammation? We're doing a better job of, of actually controlling inflammation. Again, this is an entire talk in and of itself and not really prevention, but in the context of tertiary prevention and trying to prevent the long-term complications from a diagnosis of cancer, if we have done our screening and they end up with cancer, what are we doing about that inflammation? So primary prevention is, is potentially chemo prevention or any medication that allows for mucosal healing. Secondary is what we're doing with our endoscopy and how you choose to do that or refer out if, if the patient needs chromoendoscopy and specialized um, types of techniques. 
I'm gonna skip the skin cancer, but just to remind you again, going back to our patient who we're just chatting with now because he's well, he goes and he plays a lot of golf. Okay, make sure that you are wearing suns, adequate sunscreen or that you're wearing a hat or protective clothing because skin cancer is one in five in the US and that has nothing to do with any of the immunosuppressants that we give our patients, but certainly that increases it. So again, any data that you look at, again, we're gonna go back to, to, the, to the queen of epidemiology in this area of Millie, that again, that we see that the risks are, are the, and the incidence of non-melanoma skin cancer in IBD is higher. We know that if you are on certain therapies like thiopurines, not so much um, biologics for ulcerative colitis and not methotrexate for ulcerative colitis, but certainly in Crohn's disease, which our patient has, that we do have to worry about that thiopurine as well. I'm gonna skip that. Okay, melanoma, which is, is more serious than the non-melanoma. We still have to do our primary prevention and tell him to wear sunscreen and protective clothing. And again, in the transplant population, we know that there is a significant risk from immunosuppression. The incidence is higher in our IBD population. And again, it's not five ASAs, it's biologics to a certain degree and thiopurines. So non-melanoma skin cancer is driven by thiopurine risk. So our guy is on two and a half milligrams of azathioprine doing well. It's wear your sunscreen and wear a hat. The anti-TNF is what's really driving melanoma risk, so we don't have to worry about that much for this particular patient. So primary prevention, it doesn't cost a thing for us to tell him to, to use his um, UPF over 30, and that he should be reapplying after every two hours, depending on how many holes he plays that day. Secondary is again, making sure he's getting skin examinations, or that you're, as a gastroenterologist, at least asking about hey, are you making sure that you are wearing sunscreen and that somebody is looking at your skin? Depression, again, this is something that is much more prevalent in our IBD population. Rates range up to a third of our patients are, would fit the, de the definition, clinical definition of depression. It's associated with decreased quality of life, increases functional disability and utilization of healthcare, so that if we don't spend the time to ask those two questions, it actually costs us down the road because the patients keep calling, they need more office visits, and there isn't necessarily anything actually wrong with their gut. Most treatments for depression that are prescribed are very well tolerated. He's 60, so I just wanna throw in this slide that was from the MGH group about older age and quality of life. So this was a very interesting study where the SIBDQ and the SF20 were, scores were done in populations that were stratified then by those over 60 or those younger. And this was the time of assessment, not the time of diagnosis. So there was no difference in disease activity scores. So these patients were basically the same in terms of who was in remission and who had active disease. That the older patients were more likely to have isolated colonic disease and they were on less immunomodulatory therapy. That, that they had higher SIBDQ scores and mental health-related quality of life, but they had lower physical health-related quality of life scores that was statistically significant. And that diagnosis didn't matter for the difference in scores or when they were diagnosed. So what is the bottom line here? Is that if you are older, you are at higher risk for having lower health-related quality of life scores, which then is associated with depression. He has mild hypertension, and just because we're also having to be physicians in the room, not just gastroenterologists, remember that prednisone increases your risk for hypertension, and that is a legacy that continues on for a long extended time past the, the course that they were given. Treatment starts with lifestyle modification, weight reduction, so get off the cart and onto the course and walk with your cart. Um, increased physical activity, a low sodium diet, and if treatment is necessary because you see that in the office repeatedly that their blood pressures are high when your nurse is doing their vitals and they are not seeing a primary care physician because you are their primary care physician, 
that you can start with a thiazide, but what's interesting is that if there is osteoporosis, and this is just a little clinical pearl that you may or may not ever remember, but calcium channel blockers also decrease demineralization of bone. So you get a twofer here that if you are going to start or have to ask for a recommendation for an antihypertensive in your IBD patient, that this will also help their bones. So the summary recommendations for case number one, the age-appropriate vaccinations, including zoster vaccine, which we now know what we can give him, and that we should think about his bones, colonic dysplasia, skin cancer, depression, and then perhaps his high blood pressure. And we may not treat it, but at least we may have to mention it because it is going to in, um, add to his overall uh, morbidity down the road. So thank you, we're gonna, we're gonna shift gears and talk about a younger patient now and do some more emphasis of what we've heard from Gary and Gil. Thank you. <laughs>